Kia ora team, welcome back to our 2.4 series. This is video 3. In this video, you'll be learning about osmosis as passive transport, active transport in carrier proteins, and examples of cell transport in real life. So by the end of this lesson, you should be able to compare the similarities and differences between diffusion, facilitated diffusion, osmosis, and active transport, and you should be able to explain the different examples of cell transport in plants and animals. So osmosis, what's osmosis? Osmosis is the net movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Osmosis is actually a special case of diffusion. It's a term used when the substance diffusing across a cell membrane is water. As with simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion, the water molecules are moving down its concentration gradient. So osmosis doesn't require any energy from respiration to move water molecules down a concentration gradient. Therefore, it's a type of passive transport. So osmosis has previously come up in exams in the context of root hair cells. So in plants, water is taken up from the soil by special cells on a plant's roots called root hair cells right here there's loads of them here for osmosis to happen the soil must have a higher concentration of water on the outside so the soil is on the outside and it must have a higher concentration of water than inside the root hair cell for water to be able to move from outside to inside the root hair cells this osmosis happens after rainfall when there is a higher concentration of water in the soil than inside the plant cells the water moves down the concentration gradient and into the plant through the cell membrane of the root hair cells. And all of this happens passively, meaning it doesn't require energy. So there are many different substances that can be dissolved in water. These dissolved substances are called solutes. And there are different concentrations of solutes inside and outside of our cells. The concentration of these solutes on either side of the cell's membrane, so either outside or inside, is going to affect how water moves into or out of the cell by osmosis. And the measure of the concentration that these solutes are on either side of the cell membrane is called tonicity. So we've got three different types of tonicity here. We've got a hypotonic solution, a hypotonic solution, and an isotonic solution. Hypertonic solution is a solution that has a higher concentration of solutes on the outside than on the inside of the cell. You can see here that there's more orange, more solutes on the outside than on the inside of the cell. So there are many solute particles and fewer water molecules in the solution. So hypertonic solutions are very concentrated solutions. And the water concentration is higher in the cell, so the water is going to want to move out of the cell and into the extracellular environment. It's going to move out. Hypotonic solutions is where a solution has a lower concentration of solutes on the outside of the cell than on the inside of the cell. As you can see, there's less orange on the outside of the cell than the inside of the cell. So hypotonic solutions are very dilute solutions. The water concentration is higher in the extracellular environment. So water are these blue molecules here, and there's more water on the outside than on the inside. So water is going to want to move into the cell. Whereas an isotonic solution is a solution that has a solute concentration that's equal on the outside and on the inside of the cell. See, there's four solutes here and four your solutes on the inside of the cell. So the water concentration, the blue molecules, are the same on the outside and on the inside. And so water is not really going to go anywhere. It's going to stay the same on either side. So what actually happens to the cells when they're put into these three different solutions? If the environment outside of the plant or animal cell is hypertonic, they will quickly lose water. This is because the water concentration is highest on the inside of the cell. Water mo will move down the concentration gradient out of the cell and into the extracellular environment. So this will cause animal cells to shrink. 
This is an animal cell and it's shrunk. And it will cause plant cells to become flaccid or limp. In plant cells, this water loss can actually cause the cell membrane to pull away. So this green color here is the cell membrane. And it pulls away from the cell wall. And the cell will shrink and lose its shape. We say that it becomes plasmolized. And this will cause the plant to wilt. Cells in the hypotonic solution. So if plants or animal cells are in a hypotonic solution, they'll gain water. This is because the water concentration is greatest in the extracellular environment. So water is going to move down the concentration and go into the cell by osmosis. Initially, this will call, cause animal cells to swell. But if too much water goes into the animal cells, it's going to cause it to explode. This is what's happening in this picture. This is called lysis. Lysis means to split. Now plant cells, on the other hand, are surrounded by a really strong cell wall. When water flows into the cell and causes them to, to become swollen, they become turgid. Turgid means stiff. But then the cell wall is going to prevent the cell from exploding. So it's good for plant cells to be turgid because that's what holds the plant upright and it keeps it perky. Now when animal cells are placed in an isotonic solution, they'll be able to retain a similar shape because movement is exactly balanced. So um, that's, what, that's what these arrows are showing. The movement outside balances the movement inside of the cell. When plant cells are placed in isotonic solutions, they'll become less tur slightly less turgid. All right, we're done with osmosis and now we're moving to active transport. So active transport is the complete opposite of passive transport. Active transport moves molecules across the cell membrane but against the concentration gradient. So it moves molecules from an area of low concentration down here up to an area of high concentration. You can think of active transport like pushing a large object up a hill and it takes a lot of energy to push this object against gravity, you know? And so active transport only takes place through membrane proteins because these proteins, um, we can fuel these up with ATP, which is this energy. Active transport cannot happen without this energy and without these membrane proteins. In active transport, molecules bind to a specific carrier protein. And this carrier protein changes shape to release molecules on the other side of the cell membrane. This process of changing shape needs energy because carrier proteins are moving molecules against the concentration gradient. The most well-known example for carrier protein is the sodium potassium ATP pump. This pump or carrier protein transports sodium ions to one side of the membrane and potassium ions to the other side of the membrane. First, sodium binds onto the carrier protein and then energy, ATP, is used to change the protein shape. This allows this end of the protein pump to open and let sodium out. And then potassium binds into this place. Energy is used to change the shape and spit out the potassium onto the other side. This is all happening against the concentration gradient. And so we need energy. Now let's look at different real life examples of active transport. First is the example of root hair cells. Root hair cells are special cells found on the roots of plants. And these root hair cells use active transport to help the plants take up minerals that are found in soil. And generally these minerals are more concentrated in the plant, in the roots, than in the soil. So the root hair cells have to actively move these mineral ions into the cell against the concentration gradient using these protein channels or carrier proteins. So you can see that there's more minerals inside the cell and less on the outside of the cell. So this is active transport. To be able to cope with all this active transport, root hair cells need a lot of energy from respiration. So they have a lot of mitochondria, which is not shown here. If the plant root hair cell can't do all of this active transport um, of minerals, then it won't be able to survive. The second example of active transport is in the way salt water fish can get rid of salt ions. So fish that live in the salt water take up loads and loads of salt ions that are dissolved in seawater as they gulp. This level of salt is actually really harmful to fish. But 
Fish have adapted a way to remove these ions using cells in their gills. But because the ions are in a much higher concentration in the ocean compared to the cells, the cells use carrier proteins to actively pump these salt ions out of that fish. So like with root hair cells, these cells in the gills need a lot of energy to do this, so they have a lot of mitochondria to be able to provide the energy for active transport. And the last example of active transport I want to talk about is how glucose is absorbed in our um, gut. So as humans, our bodies quickly break down the food we eat into glucose. So our cells have the fuel they need to carry out life processes. So at first, glucose has a high concentration in the gut. So high concentration diffuses into the low concentration areas, so it can move through passive transport into the cells. But eventually, as we suck all of that glucose into our cells, there's a higher concentration of glucose in the cells, and so the glucose needs to be actively transported into the cells of our small intestine, which allows them to be moved around into our body. So overall, I hope that you can now understand that active transport requires a lot of energy in the form of ATP to move these molecules against the concentration gradient. The more active transport a cell has to carry out, the more energy it's going to require. And because the more energy it requires, the more mitochondria it will need to make this energy. Well done, you've reached the end of the lesson. So by now you should be able to Compare the similarities and differences between diffusion, facilitated diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. You should also be able to explain different examples of cell transport in plants and animals. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.